Okay. Okay, so uh, last time uh, we touched one of the main assumptions for the ARIMA models, which is related to the stationarity. Okay, uh, the ARIMA models uh, need, is a strong assumption. It needs the time series to be stationary. And what that means really is that the time series has to have three elements, a constant variance, right? Uh, cannot have any trend over time, okay? And also that you won't have long patterns that are uh, repeated. In other words, non-seasonality. And that's what we're talking about. So one of the things that we did at the end was you know, try to figure out from some of the time series that the authors uh, have in the in different data sets, uh, which ones are stationary, okay? And according to the authors, the correct answers are B, right? Uh, which is the change in uh, in the, the Google stock price, right? Not the not the not the actual closing, but the what is called the difference. The difference in between the difference between the actual value and the preceding one. Okay, so that will be stationary, and also the links uh, trap a data set in Canada, which even though it has kind of a seasonality, but it's more a cyclic pattern. So because the seasonality is not periodic, then it qualifies as uh, stationary. So that's one, one aspect that we have to be aware of that. The other time series are definitely, they are uh, non-stationary because or they have trends or they have a, a strong seasonality, a, a, a periodic repeating of patterns, et cetera. All right, so, so let's talk a little bit about differences. So ARIMA, what, what, is, what is the meaning of ARIMA? ARIMA is an acronym. All right, so ARIMA, what it means is uh, the, the first two letters, AR, it's for autoregressive, right? That's the autoregressive component of that model. Then the last two characters, which is MA, is related to the moving average. And we're going to see that that moving average is not the exponential smoothing that we were you know, discussing last chapter. It has to be with the errors, okay, with the residuals. Then the I in the middle, the I in the middle is called integration. And that refers to this, uh, uh, you know, to this operation, which is differencing. In other words, differencing, what it does is that it eliminates the trend, okay, from a time series, okay, if done appropriately, right? Or it can be used also for uh, changing a seasonal time series to a non-seasonal time series. So it can work in both, uh, you know, at, at, at those levels, the trending and also uh, converting a seasonal pattern to a non-seasonal pattern. So let's see how, how we can do. So the, the example in the book is from the, from the Google, okay, from the Google uh, uh, stock price from, you know, a period of time right? And uh, when we plot the adjusted close uh, um, a column or variable in that data set, uh, we get this, this time series, okay? And as you can see, this time series, by definition, is non-stationary, right? So one of the aspects that we're going to be talking about a lot, because it's related, very close related to ARIMA, is the ACF and PACF plots, okay? The, the autocorrelation uh, uh, features and the partial autocorrelations. So in the autocorrelations, when you have this kind of time series that it really doesn't have a particular trend or even a seasonality, okay? It's just that it goes ups and downs like a, you know, it, it reflects a random one, really. So we're going to see this type of pattern in the uh, autocorrelation, which is 
that the first one is going to be the first lag, okay, autocorrelated, okay, by the by the observed value, and then the the other the other lags, like the two lags, three lags, four lags, etc. And what you see is that it descends very slowly, okay, instead of descending very sharply, as in a non say in a stationary time series, in a non-stationary, this is the path. Okay, so what can we do? So what we can do is apply the difference function, all right? So in the difference function, what it's going to do is that it's going to you know, get a number from the difference between the, the, the value that we are observing and the one that is preceding you know, in that time series. So it's going to give you like a, like a change change in those uh, observations, okay? The, the actual change. So when you do this, then we see a totally different pattern in the ACF, in this, in this plot, okay? So these are the actual numbers. And these ones are the difference, okay, from the close. So now we can see that most of the lags in those uh, in those sort of correlations are within those dotted lines, and those dotted lines are the confidence intervals, ninety-five percent confidence intervals. So anything between those dotted lines, okay, because the the you know the center line is zero. Anything between the, those center lines are non-significant. In other words, those lags are not significant, so they can be zero. The high probability of being zero. The ones that cross that barrier, okay? For example, this one here, right? Lag eight. The ones that cross that barrier, then uh, we can say that it has a significance, you know, to the autocorrelation with the with the uh, observable, with the time series, okay? But here, with the difference, we're doing pretty good in terms of the, the trending that time series into a stationary time series. And if you do a hypothesis test, right, with the what is called the L-John uh, box uh, test, which the test would be that if the p-value is uh, greater than 0 0.05, which is the threshold usually for the hypothesis testing, statistical frequentists. The, if, it, if it is more than the p-value more than 0 0.05, that means that the uh, null hypothesis cannot be rejected. And this null hypothesis says that those values behave randomly, okay? If we have a lesser value, less than 0 0.05, then we can we can reject that null hypothesis in terms of the alternate. In other words, those values are not random. They, they, they are reflecting some kind of pattern. All right. So if we apply this to the difference, to the difference on the closing price, okay, the one that is giving us this, this ACF, then we see that the uh, p value of the of the test is 0.07. Close to 0.05, though not, not that close, it's, you know, it's a little bit bigger. So we can say that that daily change in that Google stock price is essentially random, okay? And they are uncorrelated, and that's what we want, all right? So we want a time series that, it, that they have no trend, they have no, no seasonality, and they behave as a random walk, okay? Uh, they, they behave in a random, a pattern, all right? Okay, so that's basically what, you know, differencing is all about. Is that middle terminal rima differencing that is essential to then apply the AR model and the MA model, okay? All right, so uh, we talk about random work and this is just, you know, uh, a reminder, right? Uh, a random work, I'm, going, I'm just going to read it from the comments because that's basically the definition. It's a time series, when a time series is set to follow a random walk process, is, is, it behaves that the predicted value of the series of one period is equivalent, is equivalent to the value of the series in the previous period plus a random error, all right? So uh, think about a stock price. 
can you categorically say that, let's say uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday, can we predict, you know, very accurately the value of the closing of that stock price? Uh, probably not, okay? The only thing that we can do is follow, okay, certain patterns, certain trends, and make an educated guess, okay? Because if we could do that, man, we'll be rich, <laughs> okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if I knew, we have a crystal ball, and I knew, if the stock price was going down, was going up, man, I, I just have to bet when it goes down, then sell when it goes up, and that's it. But that's not how, we, how it works, okay? And there are other factors that affect that movement, okay? In terms of the volume of the trading, the trading volume, uh, what are the news that are affecting that company, which eventually affect the stock. So there are a lot of, you know, circumstances that you know some the arima model definitely you know is not going to you know uh, account for that so basically what we have can do is predict that you know last observation as a random number okay in terms not only on the value but also the direction we really don't know if it's go, going up and down okay and that's part of the the randomness that we are talking about uh, very crucial uh, definition for financial and also for econometrics, okay? So uh, the random walks, the, the epsilon, which is the residuals, the, the, the errors, they're going to be normally independent distributed with a mean of zero and a, and a variance, okay? A variance of usually variance, a standard deviation of one, okay? So the random walks models are what they use for non-stationary data, of course, particularly financial and economic data, okay? All right, so let's continue. Okay, so when we talk about differencing, we were talking about that observed value at t, uh, at certain t, and then the one preceding, t minus one, okay? In, there's another type of differencing that is called seasonal differencing. So instead of looking at the preceding value, what we're going to do is look at the preceding value of the preceding period, all right? So let's say that our seasonality is uh, a seasonal, seasonality. And we have, the, the, the time component that we have is monthly, okay? So every 12 months, there's going to be a seasonal pattern or a repeating pattern in that time series, right? Okay, for example, uh, the period in Christmas, uh, December, you can, uh, you know, you can compare it uh, December of the of the actual year with the preceding year. So those two values, when you get the difference, you are then converting that seasonality into a non-seasonal uh, time series. Okay. So instead of the value that is, you know, close to it, you are going to see if there's a seasonality, a pattern we're going to then subtract that value against the one that is from the, you know, from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the last period that, that that observation was observed, all right? So to do this, uh, the book uh, show us the, uh, the anti-diabetic drug sales, which is part of the, you know, the, the big data set of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Australian, uh, what is it called? Uh, I, I forgot the name, but it's an agency that is in charge of, uh, you know, doing all the, all the, all the drug pricing and, you know, drug, drug uh, uh, procurement, okay? So with, the, with that particular drug sale, which is A10 in that, in that data set, uh, the data set is called the PBS. Uh, you know, that, that's the acronym for that, for that agency. I, 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 for, I forgot the, you know, the, 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 the words for that, but that's the agency that in Australia that regulates the prices and everything and does the purchasing and all that, you know, it's, it's a national uh, endeavor. So we're going to filter that, right? The ATC2, which is the, you know, it, it has the cost of each of these uh, drugs. We're going to filter with A10 
which corresponds to the anti-diabetic drug sales. And then we're going to summarize the cost component of that time series, uh, add the cost, and then divide it by uh, 1 million, okay, to get, uh, you know, uh, man manageable, uh, manageable numbers. So when we do this, we do the auto plot with the cost, which is a summary of that, we get this type of time series, okay? So the first thing that we notice is that it has a trend, right? Okay, it has an upward uh, trend. So this is not a stationary time series, it's a non-stationary. Also, we can see that the variance, the amplitude, right, of that time series is increasing, uh, you know, as time progresses. Okay, so apart from the trend, also we have a non-constant uh, variance. So one of the things that we can do to normalize that variance, in other words, to, put, to get it in a uniform way before doing the differencing is to apply a log, all right? And we already have studied that in terms of the transforming the, the time series. We can apply a log and usually the log will uh, uniform that variance through time. In other words, it won't change the magnitude of the variance through the time, you know, the amplitude of the time series. And you can see it uh, in the plot when we apply the log. Then, apart from applying the log, we're going to apply also the difference. But this time, the difference is going to have a period. And the period is going to be 12 because this data is by month. So we are assuming, and the, the plot, uh, you know, is, is giving us confirmation that there is a yearly uh, seasonality, okay? So because the data is by month, the period is going to be 12, all right? So we're going to difference one observation for the time series and then look back 12 periods, okay? 12 months, right? And then we're going to subtract that value and we get the, then the difference, all right? So when we do that, we get this plot, which is going in the right direction. Sometimes we have to apply, you know, another difference sometimes. But in this case, uh, the authors feel, you know, pretty pretty good that this is a non-stationary uh, time series that we have so far. So we put we apply the log, and also we apply the seasonal difference in, instead of the unitary difference which is the one and the previous observation, okay? But sometimes you have to apply both, all right? All right? Okay, so that, that's basically the seasonal difference that the authors have discussed. So we have, uh, you know, we, we have the transformation, okay, to uniform the variance. We have the differencing for the trends. I also, we have seasonal differencing to get rid of that seasonal pattern. All right. Okay. So let me see here. Okay. Trapedis Blue Administration. Okay. Is that the agency, uh, uh, Federica, uh, in Australia? Okay. Good. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, <laughs> here in the in the U.S., uh, we don't have you know that system. Uh, most of the most of the insurance. The, the cover health in the US is private, okay? But for example, in Europe, I, I think in Australia, Japan, most of the countries, uh, they have a national agency, like, like the, for example, in the United Kingdom, I, I know is the NHS, National Health Services, that regulates, you know, it, it buys the, the, the drugs uh, and through the agency, then you can get, you know, your prescriptions and the, they regulate the cost and everything and, and the amount. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so in this, in this chapter where we're talking about differencing, we were uh, evaluating the time series, if it he, if he was stationary or not, by, you know, uh, in, a, in a visual way, okay? By, uh, you know, just plotting the time series and then doing some transformations or some difference. Uh, here, the author 
give us also some tests, a hypothesis test that we can apply to the time series to make sure that uh, you know the the visualization that we have coincides with the hypothesis uh, test result. Okay, so it's like a it's like a second opinion. Okay, in terms of okay, are you sure this is a stationary uh, time series? Okay, let's put it to the test. So there are basically two uh, tests that we can use to see if the time series is stationary or not stationary. The first one is called the ADF, the Augmented Dickey-Fuller uh, test, okay? The other one is the KPSS test, and that one is the one that the authors prefer, and I'll tell you why, okay? The ADF test is a null hypothesis in that the null hypothesis assumes that the, uh, the time series is non-stationary, okay? This is very important because the KPSS is the, is the opposite, okay? So the ADF test, augmented Dickey Fuller test, assumes that the null hypothesis, the time series is non-stationary. So the alternate, okay, the alternate hypothesis will be that the time series is stationary, correct? Okay, so if the p-value of that test is less than 0.05, that means that that time series is stationary. Okay, good, okay. The KPS, opposite, <laughs> the opposite. The null hypothesis assumes that the time series is stationary. Okay, so the alternate hypothesis will be that the time series is non-stationary. So if the p-value is less than 0 0.05 in KPSS, the result is, you know, we can reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternate, which means that the time series is non-stationary, okay? So it's kind of a puzzle there, right? You know, between the tests. But I like the KPS test because Usually we want to test if the time series is stationary, okay? That, that's what we, we want, right? If we, if we have a p-value of that time series less than 0.05, that means it's not stationary. In other words, the patterns are not random, okay? So we have to see what we can do to then get it above, the p-value above the 0.05. In the ADF test is the, the opposite, okay? So beware of that. Beware of that. Depending on the test that you're going to do, you have to make sure that you know what is the assumption for that null hypothesis. Okay. All right. So let's do an example. Let's go back to that, you know, Google Google uh, uh, stock price, right? So in our Google stock price, uh, we have the close, right? The close price, and we are going to without any, any transformation, just the, 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 the observed values. And we're going to apply from the features uh, function, you know, the fable, I think it's the fable or the, the what, what, one, of the, one of the packages that come with the, with the, with the book. Uh, we're going to apply this, the unit root the KPSS test, all right? So what happens? When we apply that, we get a p-value of 0.02. All right, so remember, KPSS, the null hypothesis is that the time series is stationary. If you get a p-value less than 0.05, that means that you can reject that uh, assumption in favor of the alternate, which is that the time series is non-stationary, okay? So with this p-value of 0.02, we can say that that time series is not stationary, right? Because we are rejecting, we are rejecting the null hypothesis, which says that it's stationary, all right? Okay, so when we apply the difference, and we saw that in one of the plots, we're discussing the, the difference. When you apply the difference and then apply the unit root KPSS test, then the value is, 0 0.1, okay? So that value is greater, 
than 0 0.05. So that means that we don't have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis in the KPSS test says that this uh, time series is stationary, okay? So by uh, doing the differencing of that observation, it's already uh, giving us uh, a, a, a result in the hypothesis test that that series is behaving as a stationary series, okay? So in the, I don't, I don't know if we have, if we have time, maybe, you know, later uh, uh, we'll have, but there was an exercise in one of the, in, in, in one of the markdowns uh, uh, files that the authors uh, provide, you know, for, for teaching, you know, teaching materials. Uh, there was an exercise on the tourism data set. Uh, it says to compute the total number of trips and find appropriate differences after transformation is necessary to obtain a stationary data. Okay, so I did the, the, the exercise, uh, it's in the GitHub. So if you can just, you know, run it and you, you'll see the difference because I ran that with the KPS test, KPSS test and also with the ADF, just to make sure that they are congruent, even though they come from different, different assumptions. Okay, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a good exercise. And also it's a good exercise to, you know, manipulate that, uh, that, uh, that data set because it has, you know, a lot of, a uh, lot of time series. Data. Okay. All right. So let me check the chat. Uh, fa fable, yeah. Fable tools. Yes. That's the one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, 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 there are a couple of, uh, of libraries there, you know, just bundle up in that FPP3. All right. So Good? We're good? We're good? Okay. So let's go on. All right, so uh, uh, this is just uh, you know, a reminder of the notation that the authors are using for what is, what is called backshift uh, notations. And backshift, what is really is the, the, it is the notation for the legs. So for example, if you have yt, right, yt, the first lag is going to be y uh, time mi t minus one, right? The one preceding, the value preceding the, the observed value. So that is equal to what is called b, you know, capital B and yt. And that's the notation for that. And then you can use that notation to go beyond the first lag. In other words, if you are talking about the second lag, then you can square that B, right? The, the back shift of the back shift of the other value, you can square it and it's going to be the same as Y T minus two, all right? So remember those lags are, the, the first lag is the preceding value. The second lag is the two preceding values. The third lag, three preceding values and so forth, all right? And wh why, you know, the authors are, are you know, uh, doing this is because Arima uses those legs uh, to make, you know, to, 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 to they use it in the model of, of Arima. It use uh, extensively those legs. All right. Okay. So that's basically, you know, that's, you know, take it by faith there, <laughs> the notation. All right. So let me go to the book. Okay, because this is just a summary of what the book says. So let me go to the book. And we are going to talk now about, remember, ARIMA, right? We talk about the I component, which is the differencing. It could be uh, a standard differencing from the previous value, and also could be a seasonal differencing, depending on the, the time series uh, that you have. Then the AR, is the autoregressive component, okay? And what we are, the definition of autoregression, auto, auto autoregressive is that we are using the same values of the time series with the lags as the predictors, as the predictors for the future values, okay? So for example, if you see 
the you know the function, okay, the formula, the formula for the autoregressive model. He says that yt, right, which is the the last observed value, yt, okay, where where where, where t t is uh, you know t minus zero, right, the observed value. Then we have a c component, okay, which is let me make sure that we have you know what we take. Uh, the the okay the c is going to be it's going to be like a constant okay it's, it's like the intercept but this one is very important the residuals the epsilon t which is what is called the white noise in other words is the residual that is going to behave in a random in a random pattern then you have the lags okay of the observed values of the time series which is good is going to be this is the first lag this is the second lag and so forth you know how many lags you know you put in the in the formula and then you will have a coefficient applied to those lags okay which is uh, uh, you know represented by uh, phi okay so this is very similar to the regression model that we are used to right where we have a constant, uh, a, 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 a better not, right? A constant. Then we have uh, one of the predictors, x1, right? With their coefficient, x2 with the coefficient, x3, and so forth. The only difference here from that model that we know to the autoregressive model is that in the normal linear regression, those x's, those predictors, they are independent of one another, okay? In other words, they should not exhibit a correlation between those predictors. They, they should be uncorrelated, right? That's why multicollinearity give us so much, you know, so much headache in, in, in that particular model. In this model, remember that the time series is a sequence of observations. So those observations, they already have that constraint. Okay, that they have that time component. So what is what is happening is that that yt value, the predictors are going to be the preceding values of that yt. All right, and that's what we call the lags. All right, it's going to be the predictor is going to be the lag of that yt through time. Okay. And that's basically the major difference. Yes, uh, phi is, uh, is one of the smoothing parameters, but it's, it, yeah, it has like a coefficient because remember this formula, we're going to be looking for the best model, right? Okay, liking the ordinary uh, linear regression. And one of the things that we're going to be uh, kind of maximizing is what is called the likelihood estimate. estimate. Okay, but we're not there yet, okay? We're just you know gathering some thought about the model that we are the, the, the you know the arima to understand the model the components of arima okay so for an r model one model one the model one is going to be the the constant you know the c plus a lag okay it's going to be only this part okay that's the r uh and uh, between parentheses one. And we can see an example here. Okay, this is the narrow one. Okay. And more or less, you know, how we would behave, you know, that pattern. There's also an R2, which incorporates two legs from the observed value. Okay, so AR1, AR1 model incorporates only one leg. Okay. So for that model, when phi is zero, okay. In other words, or in other words, we discard this. We only stay with uh, we see, right? We see that is going to be equi equi uh, equivalent to y noise. Okay. If phi is one and c is equal to zero, okay. So we eliminate this one and we stay only with y uh, y t minus one. That is equivalent to random walk. Okay. If we have phi equal to one and c not equal to zero, in other words, there's a there's a number here in c, 
c plus y t minus one, then that is equivalent to a random walk with drift. Okay, so there's going to be a kind of a trend. Okay, a level, a level with this with this c not equal to to zero. And if phi is negative, okay, it's a negative value, then y t is going to oscillate between positive and negative value. Okay, so that's going to be the behavior of that yt or that result when we uh, change those parameters, the z and the and the phi. Okay, and that's for R1 model. For the R2 model, there are also you know different different formulas for that. And more than two, uh, the author you know doesn't explain it uh, in the book, but he says that the fable uh, package. Uh, already has the, you know, the formulas to deal with it. Okay. Okay. So that is that is the AR component, the formula for the AR component of Arima. Then the other component that we have not discussed, and it's part of Arima, is the MA, right? The moving average. And this moving average model, what it does is that it uses past forecast errors. Uh, the author says that you shouldn't confuse it with exponential smoothing, okay? This is a regression model still, okay? The only thing is that now, instead of the y, the lags, we're going to be using those errors, okay? Those errors from, you know, from those lags that are not coinciding with the, with, with, with the observed values, okay? Because those are, these are the residuals here. And it's basically the same formula. The only thing that you have to substitute the, the y with the epsilon, the residuals, okay? And one of the things that, uh, one of the aspects that the author discusses is the invertibility of the MA and the AR are process. So for example, in any MA and the parameter of MA uh, uh, of the moving average is Q, Okay, and we're going to see what Q, you know, where Q, where does Q come comes from? Uh, any MAQ process can be written as an AR with infinite uh, lags uh, process, but it says that we have to impose some constraints on the MA parameters. Okay, and this invertibility of the Arima model, okay, because of the uh, relationship between IR and MA is equivalent to the forecastability of an ATS model. Okay, so there is a relationship between what we saw in the ATS model, error, trend, seasonality, and then the ARIMA with that MA activated. Okay, because the MA could could could, could be zero, okay, depending on the the best you know, uh, forecasting model that we can obtain with the time series that we have, all right? Good. So we discussed differencing the I term in ARIMA. We discussed AR, autoregressive, which is the lags, okay, as predictors of the observed value. And then we discussed MA, which just is the errors, the residual errors of the past forecast uh, combined with the autoregressive. All right. So for a non-seasonal ARIMA model, okay, non-seasonal ARIMA, remember that we have to difference that. For that, this is the formula for the ARIMA model. Okay. So we have the lags, we have the errors, okay, AR, we have MA, and also the I is going to be the difference to convert the non-stationary to stationary. All right, so the best way you know, to view this is to do an example, correct? Because now that we have the theory, let's see if we can apply it to an example. So we're going to uh, go back to our global economy uh, data set, the one that we were studying with, uh, with the Italian exports. Now in the book, we're going to be filtering with Egyptian, Egyptian exports, okay? So the code for Egypt is A-G-Y, uh, and with the autoplot, you get this kind of time series, okay? 
uh, which has, it doesn't really have a definite trend that we can see here, but definitely has its up and downs, okay? So apparently has some seasonality or some cyclic patterns that we have to, you know, deal with. Okay. So let's say that we apply the non-seasonal ARIMA model automatically, okay? Without doing any transformation, without doing any difference, okay? So what we do is that we filter uh, the country for Egypt, and then we apply this function, ARIMA, to the exports with the function model, okay? So we're going to apply the model ARIMA to the exports, okay? Which is the column of interest. And what it's going to do is that it's going to fit an ARIMA model to the time series. And as uh, we did with the ordinary regression that we use summary here, we use report. So we can see inside that fit and model, what are the uh, coefficients, the parameters, and also what is the, the metric. The, the, the metric the, the metric that the model uh, results from, from this application. So here we see that there's an ARIMA of 201. That corresponds to the period P, okay? The differencing, which is zero, there's no differencing, right? We didn't apply anything. And then a Q that is equal to one. And we're going to see you know, what those, where, the, where those uh, parameters come from, okay? With, uh, with me, we have the coefficients, right? Is, a, is this an R1 or R2 model? Is this an R1 or R2 model? Remember the R1, R2 models? This? Yeah. Okay. So think? like um, uh, R2? There, there you go, yeah. Yeah, because it has AR1, AR2, okay? And also that P, that two corresponds to the P to the periods, okay? So that P is going to tell you what kind of model ARIMA is saying that is the best model. Be, be, remember, uh, it, 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 it internally is doing some, you know, uh, estimation of different models. And the author will explain how, you know, what, what is the, 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 the algorithm that is doing insight. But it didn't arrive 201 just, you know, because, you know, that's the, that's the one that, that it tried first. It tried different models. And that one is the one that is giving us the least AICC, okay? One not seen internally, but that's the result when we apply ARIMA without any parameters, okay? It does, you know, uh, an automatic uh, optimization of, of the model, okay? So we got, uh, uh, like Federica said, we got an R2 model, Right. In other words, we have two legs here. We're, you know, uh, doing the regression with two legs. There is no differencing. That's the, the 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 D component, which is the I component, and then we have the Q component, which is the MA one. Okay. So in the moving average, we're just using one lag for the 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 errors. In other words, we're using this model this model here okay the constant the the you know the 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 residuals at the observed time and then the residuals of one leg okay and that's the model that we are you know that the 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 arima optimization uh is telling us that that's the most optimal you know so far okay so one of the things that we can do because this is a regression right so how do we validate the model? Well, uh, we can do an analysis of the residuals, of, of the epsilons, of the residuals. And this function, we have, we have seen it already. A GG, a TS residuals, that gives you three plots, okay? One is the progression of the, of the errors of the residuals through time, okay? 
they should behave in a random pattern, right? With a mean zero and standard deviation of one. Then we have our ACF, autocorrelation uh, uh, plot. And those lags, if they are not significant, that means that those lags uh, are behaving randomly. In other words, there's no pattern there, okay? And most of the lags are within those two dollar lines. That means that they are within that significance interval. So they're not significant. And then the third one is that the residual should behave as a normally independent distributed uh, distribution with mean zero and variance, uh, variance of one, okay? Or standard deviation of one. And we can see that, yeah, you know, you can, you can plot in your mind, you can plot, you know, like a density, a bell curve, and you see the pattern, the pattern there. So at least in that, this model, even though it has this up and downs, uh, the model is being validated by these plots, okay? In terms of the receiver. Now, uh, we can do a forecast, okay? Now that we have a model, we can do a forecast and we can forecast for let's say 10 years or 10 periods, right? Because here the time component is in years. So that's the minimal period that we have. So we can fit, we can use the fit model. We can forecast with the horizon equal to 10 and then do the auto plan. And that will be from ARIMA, ARIMA model, that will be the forecast, okay? For the next 10 years with their corresponding uh, confidence intervals, okay? Any, any questions so far, any comments? Good, all right. So let's go on, okay. The authors mentioned that there's a relationship between ARIMA, especially the AR and MA components and the ACF and PACF plots, okay? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time, you know, to go deep into what is the difference between the partial autocorrelation plot and the autocorrelation, okay? But I inserted in my notes, I inserted this link. And this link is from a, an article that talks in, in depth about how to interpret the ACF and PACF plots for the time series forecasting, especially for the ARIMA model. And one of the things that the authors mentioned and also the article uh, you know, emphasizes is that, that that PCF, that PCF plot is intimately related with the order of the AIR model. In other words, the PCF, if interpreted correctly, it will give you a very good estimate of that P component, okay? The first, the first uh, parameter of ARIMA, okay? Which is how many lags do I need to get the mess correlation for the observed value? That's what the PCA is telling, okay? Then the ACF, okay? Which if you see this, uh, this video, what it will tell you is that the PACF is a direct correlation between the lag you know, uh, values of the observed value, okay? Is the direct uh, relation, even though it says partial, but it's direct. The ACF incorporates direct and indirect correlations between those lag values too, okay? And the ACF, that parameter from the MA can be derived from the ACF plots. So the PACF is going to help you with the AR part of ARIMA, okay, to uh, get an estimate of the P component. And then the ACF is going to give you an estimate of the MA, of the Q parameter. ARIMA has three parameters, P, D, and Q. P is the lags that you're going to use for the ARIMA model, for the AR model. D is the differencing degree, okay, one or two. Uh, usually you don't need more than two, okay? It, it just fluctuates between zero and two uh, in, you know, in, in, in a, you know, in a pragmatical way. Then 
you have the MA order, which is given by the Q uh, component. And the Q component, you can derive it from the ACA. So we were, were, we were uh, studying the exports of uh, Egypt, right? Egyptian exports. So we're going to stay here you know, with that, uh, you know, with that time series, but instead of using the GGTS residuals, we are going to use the TS display function. And what it does with that, this, this argument called plot type uh, equal to partial, what it's going to give you is the original time series, okay, the observed values, and then it's going to give you also the ACF and the PACF, okay, in, in, that, in that bunch. The same way as the TS residuals give you three plots, this one is going to give you also three plots. But it's the original time series, the ACF, and the PACF. So let's see the PACF, okay, which is to the right. As you can see, most of them, you know, this, this one, this lag is, is lag zero, okay? Is, but, uh, you know, comparing the observed value with itself. And this one always is going to be, you know, one, right? If you compare the observed value with itself, it's going, the correlation is going to be one, okay? Because it's the same value, okay? The same pattern. But then you see that using those uh, uh, dotted lines, dot, dotted blue lines, which gives the significance or not, you see that there are two, uh, you know, lags that are significant. One is lag two, and one is lag four. Okay, so if you use an RM model, okay, an ER, a, a AR model, autoregressive model, which one will you choose, the two or the four? Okay. To try to get the best, you know, the most information uh -huh. from those lines. Okay, maybe the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we choose lag two, <laughs> yeah. if we choose lag two, then we're not going to get lag four, okay? But if we choose lag four, we're going to get lag one, lag two, lag three, and lag four. Even though lag three is not significant, but we want to capture the most information from the correlations, okay? So we want to capture this. We want to capture uh, exactly. lag two. Well I I, uh -huh. I, did, I don't uh, actually understand the first one. So I'm, I'm, I'm in the second, the, uh, because we had the second and the fourth to choose from. So I, I said the second. But I didn't understand right. the first one. Why this is uh, equal to itself or something? Equal to one? I don't... I don't uh... Yeah, okay. Yeah. The, the, the first lag, o sea, lag zero, lag zero the lag zero is always going to be one, okay? Because it's going to be the value against itself, okay? Uh, here, what we have is really lag one, okay? And we have this big spike that says that lag one is very significant to the observed value, okay? Then we have lag two, okay? And lag two is negative, okay? So it's going the, the opposite direction, but it's still significant. Lag three is not significant, but because the model is sequential, if you are going to use lag four, you are going to use lag one, lag two, lag three, and lag four, okay? To capture this part of, you know, the correlation information that the plot is giving, okay? Okay, so with this partial autocorrelation, we could try a model of AR4, okay? So in other words, when we go to the equation, this equation here, okay? What we're saying is, is that we're going to use the first lag, we're going to use the second lag, we're going to use the third lag, T minus three, and we're going to use the fourth lag, T minus four. So the model is going to be an AR, Four more. Okay, got it. That 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 is the is 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 the is the, the number gives you 
how many lags you're going to use for that formula. That, that, that's all it does, okay? Okay, so we talk about the autocorrelation, right? The autocorrelation uh, plot, which is direct and indirect correlations. Here, we're not going to use a number to activate the moving average, okay? We're going to do an experiment. Just want to do an experiment, but you could try, for example, activating the MA component, which is the last parameter, the Q parameter, with one and with two. All right. But right now, we're going to just test our model just with the P, the P component, the P component with zero difference in zero MA. MA. Okay. So we apply that, right? We we'll apply that here. And as you can see, instead of just leaving the exports alone, we're going to introduce those parameters, P, D, Q, okay? P, D, Q. P for the lags of the AR, D for differencing, and Q for the model for the MA, okay? Which are the lags too for the, for the, for the, for the receivers. So we're, we're doing just an AR model, okay? And then we're going to do a fit, fit two, another model, and then we're going to report it. And it gives you the summary, right? I went to use an ARIMA of 400. Zero, zero. These are the predictors, right? The lags, ARIMA 2, ARIMA, ARIMA 1, ARIMA 2, ARIMA 3, ARIMA 4, with a constant. There's no MA. There's no moving average. We're not, we're not using that. And then we have, this is the, this is the, 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 you know, the, the, the most important value. And the AIC corrected, which gives you 294.7. Uh, because the only way that you can compare that with another model that is using the same data, okay? Because you cannot compare with other time series. For that, you have to use an RMSE or an MMA, mean average error, et cetera. Here, you have to stay within the same time series. So if we compare this with the one that the ARIMA calculated automatically, all right, you know, did, did the optimization automatically, we can see that the AAC here is 294.29. And the model that we constructed with the PACF plot is 294.7. So there's not that much difference, right? Okay, you could use one or the other models, or depending on your, your, you know, your, your approach, okay? But it's a warning that the authors give you that you should not rely completely on the optimization routine that ARIMA provides automatically, okay? You should also try different models that maybe that optimization routine is not trying because it's, it's not trying everyone. Okay, it's just trying a, a subset, a subset, what, what is called a state space, uh, you know, uh, definition, which is part of the universe of, of all possible uh, parameters. And the reason is that because ARIMA is compute, you know, com computer uh, expensive, uh, you just have to try, uh, you know, a, a couple of models to make sure that you get a good, you know, optimization within that state stay space, all right? But here with the PACF and we can test, for example, we can activate this to see if we can get a better, a, a better model, okay? And, you know, I'll let, you know, uh, other, others to try it. Uh, we can get a pretty decent model without, you know, just relying on the optimization routine of our Okay, so let's see, it's 2.58. So uh, let's stop here, all right? Let's stop here. And I, you know, encourage you, you know, to try, uh, you know, different, different models here. Try that model with uh, activating MA, you know, with one, okay? Instead of 400, 401, and see what happens. I mean, the, the time series is very, you know, it's very uh, short. So you, you won't, you know, <laughs> you want to spend too, too much time there. All right, so 
Okay, so this is the end. Stop, right? Stop.